daddy folks, it is Diecast Buffet here again. Welcome back to NASCAR Thunder 2004, time for race 14 out of 36, the Pocono 500. Well, Dover was a barn burner, guys. And guess who got it done? Jeff Burton won at Dover. Awesome, awesome stuff. Um, your next couple races coming up, Pocono, Michigan, and Infineon. Love these tracks, guys. So we gained about 20 points on Earnhardt. Uh, we led the most laps, had a dominating effort at Dover, and just, just, just barely lost it on tire wear. Uh, Jeff Burton did a fantastic job. And that brings me to my next point. Jeff Burton has a legitimate shot at the championship, and here's why. Look at his average finish thus far, a 9.8. To put this in perspective, look at his championship standings back in the late 90s, and look at his average finish. I'm just saying, guys, he's doing really good. I know he had a great one in 2010, but I, I think Jeff Burton could be a legitimate sleeper for the championship because there's always a guy back here that wins a couple races and starts charging his way to the front. You never know. You never know. He could he could be a sleeper. He probably won't, right? Let's just be honest, but you never know. I'm curious, let's go check out the sponsorship. And uh, we have 18 races left um, on the hood. We have 15 races left on the the, the deck lid, uh, which is interesting. That one's going to go out before the other ones. And then we have 15 races on our side sponsor. So uh, that's interesting. Uh, anyways, uh, nothing to do in the garage there. I might get a new right front changer. Let's see. Your front tire carrier changer. Let's see. He has no happiness. Well, Chris Myers. Can we replace Chris Myers on this team? <laughs> He's clearly not happy. Um, skill, speed. I don't know. He's got no happiness. Do they perform worse if they have no happiness? I, I've always wondered that. I have no idea. We're going to keep Chris Myers because why not? We'll keep him for the Fox Funnies. But uh, <laughs> just kidding. Anyways, uh, let's see. We're going to Pocono. We're going to need a very, very good race car. Um... And you can pretty much run your exact Pocono car at Michigan because they're just so similar, you know. Gigantic racetracks, a lot of horsepower. These ones have a little bit of wear on them, though. So let's go to Pocono. Alrighty, folks. So we qualified on the pole for the Pocono 500. Let's go. Trackside. MRN is live in Pennsylvania today at the Pocono Raceway for the Pocono 500. And Barney, there are a few unique twists to this 2.5 mile trioval. Unique is definitely the word for this racetrack. First of all, there are only three corners, each of which has completely different banking, which also means there are three straightaways. And guess what? They're all different links. This is one tough racetrack to prepare a race car for. The 82 car has had some run-ins with other drivers recently on the racetrack. If they don't want this to become a problem on the track and with NASCAR, these guys need to use their heads a bit out there. You can rub fenders now and again, but it shouldn't be a weekly occurrence. Bobby Labonte has an impressive average finish this year. If you finish top 10 every week, then the championship becomes an attainable goal. This team wants to get the big money at the end of the year, so they're going to be working even harder to keep up this string of top finishes. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is in the top five in points so far this season. He just needs to keep digging like he has been. Sometimes when drivers reach the top five in points, they start to push themselves too hard on race day and wind up losing spots instead. I'm sure he doesn't want that. Oh boy, here we go, fellas. Got Jimmy Johnson on the front row. We barely kicked him off from the pole, but Elliot Sadler, that top four, that's interesting. Probably won't be around there much longer, but we'll see how it shakes out, fellas. All right, so the summer stretch is on. Um, we're getting closer and closer to Daytona. That's the unofficial halfway point. Uh, we're good in the championship right now. We're 150 50 points out. I'm not worried about it. We had a great run at Dover. We proved that we can... We can, we can be competitive at most of these racetracks, and not just by top tens, but winning the races. How will Pocono go? Let's see. 
This is a track that we need to make sure we're good at both Pocono races because every point matters. And when you go to these tracks, you have to race twice. It's very critical you have a great run. Now, I don't think Jimmy Johnson's a legitimate championship favorite this season, so I'm not worried about him leading a lap. He can go lead a lap. I'd rather be patient and methodical and cerebral and work my way through the front. Like, I'll push Elliot Sadler if I have to. I mean, if he could just get on the gas and go. I don't think he's got the car to get around, to tell you the truth. I think we're going to have to get on by him. It's a cool-looking paint scheme. It's kind of a shame they didn't get none of his alternates because he had some different paint schemes for the 2003 season. And he only uh, added this one in his test car. He threw a block there, but we stopped it. <laughs> oh, Nelly. And then, like, in the next game, NASCAR um, Chase for the Cup, I think they had, like, three or four different paint schemes for Elliott Sattler. So they made up on it, right? They made up on it. Uh, but 03, he had some cool cars as well that are kind of forgotten about because none of the paint schemes are in this game. And I don't think they made all of them in the 164 scale, uh, except for the Elite 164s or whatnot. And, you know, a lot of the kids at those times didn't collect those. They usually just collect whatever was at the winner circle or, uh, you know, action racing collectible, um, you know, cars and stuff. The normal ones, not the not the open hood ones. That's the ones I usually collected, um, and I still collect nowadays. I always like the closed cast uh, 164 die cast, personally. Meanwhile, I got that lap led there, so that's five bonus points. Add that to the stockpile. And we're out front at Pocono. This track's been very good to us, though, that's for sure. We've won here a lot. We've won it in both races, the Pennsylvania 500 and the Pocono 500. I love this track, man. It, it's, it is one of my like favorite uh, motorsports tracks because it doesn't matter if it's a stock car. It doesn't matter if it's an open wheel car. If you bring a good you know rules package to these vehicles, they both put on a fantastic race. Like I think IndyCar needs to come back to Pocono. Like it's asinine to me they don't race here. Like it's such a great track for them. And then the stock cars or the next gen cars, they race here pretty good. They really do. Um, the Gen Six car is the reason why Pocono got taken off the schedule from having two races to a double header to just one event. That's only a 400 miler. It's the Gen Six car because this place used to be such a big deal. Like, if you go and ask someone in the Northeast, what was Pocono like in the 2000s? They will tell you it was a big expletive deal, okay? It's like Dover in the 2000s. It was a big expletive deal. Uh, the Northeastern Cats, they love Pocono. And it's a shame to see it only at one race on the schedule nowadays, at least at the time of this video. Hopefully in the future it'll get back to two races. It does beg the question, will they ever reconfigure this track? Will they ever tear it down or sell it? I sure hope not. I mean, clearly you can see there's like a million acres of trees around here. So hopefully the property value is not too much. From my understanding, the value of the property isn't that valuable. So, I mean, if they really wanted to, they could buy anywhere else <laughs> but a racetrack, you know? Isn't it funny how they always want to buy the racetracks? They're like, okay... We could build anywhere else near the interstate. No, let's just go buy the racetrack itself and then build there. Oh, I hate seeing racetracks getting torn down, man. Especially like the small, uh, short tracks, the local ones that have been around for ages. Sad to see them go. Because you know what, like, with, with football, football stadiums and stuff, even though the, the game itself, you know, it will be the same in different stadiums, the atmosphere will never be the same. Right. Well, with racetracks, when they go, the racing will never be the same because the, the, the entire racetrack can't be replicated. You know, the temperature, the cloud cover, X, Y, and Z, you can pave it inch for inch, the absolute perfect carbon copy of whatever Nazareth Speedway. But if you put it anywhere else than where it was, the racing won't be the same because of the cloud cover, because of the temperatures, how the track ages, X, Y, and Z. All of those things are characteristics of a racetrack. So it's it's impossible to replicate one. It really is. Because the nature aspect of it will always change it. 
you can get it close, right? You could you could build it exactly how it is, but the temperatures and wherever you build that same exact race racetrack will never be replicated. With sports stadiums, you know, the game itself is the same, it's just the atmosphere will never be. So that's why it's more I think it's more sad when you see great racetracks go like Fontana. Because hypothetically we still have Michigan, right? You know, if they really wanted to, they could build another two and a half, two mile track somewhere else. But it never will be Fontana, you know. All right, so Kevin Harvick's in second. He's he's hanging tough. He's not he's not just falling off. We're not exactly pulling away either. Our tires are starting to wear, and you can see it, in, especially in these flat portions. Cars taking longer and longer to rotate. Will pit stops begin? Or they go around another another way. Pit stops will start here. I do not like pitting here, guys. Because what's going to happen? The guys that are pitting right now are probably going to cycle to the lead. Okay, they'll probably be up front for three to four laps, and then their tires will start equalizing and falling off. With the last four to five laps of this race, they're going to be on full defense mode. I don't want to be defense mode. I want to be on offense. So. Pit late if you want to have a good finish at Pocono. That's generally what I like to do. It does vary. Um, if you're back in the pack, you might only have the only option of pitting early. Uh, they try to leapfrog him, maybe catch a caution or something. You never know. But um, I like pitting a little bit later. At least past lap 10 or 11. That's what I try to shoot for. You could stretch it later. I mean, we're halfway on fuel. I mean, in reality, we could probably go to lap 15 if we really wanted to. And watch these guys just take off. The, the new tires here at Pocono are just so freaking good, man. This six car and stuff, if we're not careful, is going to run us over in the tunnel turn. So We might be good on the straightaways, but once you get to that corner and we're having to lift, that's where that six car is going to really eat us up here. I mean, look at this. <laughs> I mean... We're slipping and sliding, and we're about to get passed by Clay Dixon in the in the number six car. Yeah, it's tempting to pit right now. It really is, but long term, you do not want to pit. It's better to endure. I don't want to let Kevin Harvick lead this lap. I, I don't want to give him those five wins to cut points. But every lap you hold out is another lap you'll be faster than everyone else. Because these guys, yeah, they're fast right now, but when it comes down to the pay window, they will be nothing but sitting ducks on the racetrack. All right, so Kevin Harvick has got a very, very stout piece on old tires because he's hounding us. I mean, we, I mean, we can't even get to the tunnel chart without causing smoke. I think Harvick might be pitting this time. If that's the case, that's cool. I'm going to stay out another lap because I just... I've seen these Pocono races too many times. I know what I want from my car. I want absolute grip. I want the tires to be in my favor. And that is pitting late. Lap 11, coming to lap 12, I think this would be a good time to pit. Even if the 8 car stays out, I would rather pit now. So we just bought ourselves, what, 2, 3 extra laps... Of tire wear, which, you know, in a 20 lap race, that's a microcosm of what, of like 100, 150 laps at Pocono. So that's like, I don't know, what, eight, nine, maybe 10 laps, give or take more or less. I mean, you can just see how horrible these tires are. And we're racing against the slow cars, by the way. We're not racing against Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson on fresh tires. These are the guys that usually finish 30th every week. I'm going to go ahead and pit now. We're losing way too much track position. We got the tires. We saved enough. No damage repair. Don't touch the race car. Oh, boy. Pit crew, it's in your hands. Lord help us. <laughs> How y'all doing, fellas? Uh, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And give me a swig of coffee here. Just need a clean pit stop, guys. A 16.2 would be great. I was going to replace the right front uh, changer because 
he had that uh, that horrible pit stop at the Coke 600, but we couldn't get any, anyone better, so we're going to keep him. 16.7, not a terrible pit stop, but could be better. All right, so this is where the games begin. Who's going to be the leader, and how is this going to shake out? Pocono Merge is very dangerous, by the way, because there's literally no apron. It looked like we just destroyed Elliot Sadler's run. Maybe we did, but truth be told, there's just not an apron. There's no runoff there. Um, the AI usually needs to go higher uh, to to avoid that, but it is what it is. I just realized we were going 205 uh, down that straightaway, and we just completely scuffed up our tires. All right. So race leader right now is Earnhardt, followed by Jeff Burton in second. I think Burton and Earnhardt have not pitted yet. Burton did win at Dover. Hey, hey. It's cool to see the 99 win. The 16 cars, the next guy we need to pass, or, or female, rather. Tina Gordon in the 16. I don't think that car ahead of us is the 16, though. It looks like it has an orange back bumper. I could be mistaken. Yeah, everyone's pretty strung out. But once again, fellas, the word of the day, the drinking word, is tire wear. It always bites you when you pit early at Pocono. It always does. I mean, I've had moments where I'd be right now and it'd be five to go. And I'm like, there is no, there is not a snowball's chance of catching the race leader. And what do I know? With two to go, I'm already past the leader. The tire wear at Pocono, it is a, it just destroys you. Because, I mean, the track is ten lanes wide on the front straightaway. I mean, it's impossible to block everyone. We're like, what, four seconds out, give or take? If we could just quit botching the tunnel turn, we'd probably be pretty good right now. All right, so everyone cycled through. Your official race leader is Bobby Labonte and Kevin Harvick. Bobby Labonte would be a cool winner as a Texas native. Our two upset winners this year are technically three. Um, Michael Waltrip at Talladega. Elliot Sadler at Martinsville. That was really cool. And then we just saw Burton, which... For the fans who don't know, he's only won like two or three races this, this entire playthrough, so I consider that an upset. So we've had some interesting winners, and we still have two more plate races, and we still have two road courses, and you never know what's going to help, hap you know, hap happen at these other tracks. Because you know, one caution would really help out these um back marker cars because the caution comes out in the middle of the paint of pit sequence like at martinsville traps enough cars to lap down and guess what <laughs> it really helps them stay up front and they pretty much can't lose or if you have a dnf it roulette wheels the rest of the field so anyways got tony stewart right here he's blocking us but you see how quickly we've ran down the leaders in two laps we've already dug into their lead and now we got a four car gaggle here uh, then ahead of Gordon would be Harvick and then Bobby Labonte now Bobby Labonte and Kevin Harvick's best case scenario here is a caution to go at that happens at with uh, lap 18 to lap 20 that's their best way of winning this race because then the race would end early under caution or perhaps on lap 17 because the, the track is pretty big I don't know how the pace laps work for each track in this game. But essentially, it might give them enough to uh, go ahead and call the race. But uh, we got to get around these guys first. And I'm not trying to tear up my race car because we're going to have to run this exact piece. Um, at, probably at Michigan. Or actually, did we get... Yeah, okay, we got our second Speedway car worked on. So we would have an option. Okay, never mind on that. We can tear it up. I was about to say... <laughs> If we don't have a spare one, I can't afford to uh, tear up the race car. This is the time to go. 215 miles per hour of that front stretch, guys. That is how stock car racing should be. And, and, and Bobby Labonte just got his lunch money taken from Kevin Harvick. I mean, he is gone. Johnson, really don't block me. I, you're going to get hit, Johnson. You blocked me. You blocked me, Johnson. 
I love you, Jimmy, but you blocked me there. That was a bad move, brother. Uh, you blocked me on the tunnel turn, running me to the apron. Have you not seen the crashes at Pocado? When someone has a brake failure and they go in the corner head on? You don't think that same thing's going to happen when you go head on to the wall, injuring on a freaking apron? Caution comes out, the race is over. Man, I don't think we're going to be able to catch Kevin Harvick, guys. I don't remember what tire strategy he was on. I, he pitted a lap before us, so he probably gained enough track position. But I'm trying, man. I really am. Got to get around Labonte. We've got to just get through this tunnel turn nice and smooth. And we bowl the tires again. That's always great. But the good news is we do have Tony Stewart here. We can use him as a little bit of a drafting help. Pocono is a drafting track. Drafting is huge, especially on the straightaway. Just one to two miles per hour difference makes a huge improvement. Like right here, right now. Look at all this. It's going to be over 200 miles an hour. 216 miles per hour. Whew, man. You want to talk about stock car racing. 216 miles per hour. If Pocono is not considered a cathedral of speed, I don't know what is. I mean, it's it's literally big enough to be an airport. Like, that's how freaking huge Pocono is. You could land a freaking plane on the front stretch with ease. The 20 car is still there. I gotta get around this 20 guy. I, I, I don't think we're about to catch Kevin Harvick, but you know what? We, we tried. Because now we don't have that drafting help, and it's just going to be sheer horsepower. But hey, second place is not bad. Led the most laps. Took care of our car. Kind of the same song, second verse, as last week, but maybe Kevin Harvick just made enough improvements. They just, you know, outdrove us. That might be the case. I have seen the AI do that, where they just, they'll pit, they make their cars better, and they just, they're just better. That might be the case. Or perhaps pitting one lap earlier was the, the right stop. Who knows? be too little too late if we had one more lap maybe because we gained a lot of time entering turn one but it's just going to be too little too late and kevin harvick from bakersfield california is going to win the pocono 500 for richard childress racing and the good wrench monte carlo big win for childress i'll take the points day though i'll take it oh boy so we get I think, yeah, we'll get the same amount of points as Kevin Harvick because we had the most laps led. So, hey, we'll, we'll freaking take that, man. Well, luckily our rivals are starting to go away, so that's always good. And we, we got the most laps led bonus by three laps. Junior led one. Johnson led one. Uh, Stewart, I don't think Gordon led any either. Let's see. Nope, no lap, lap led for Gordon. Uh, but, hey, same amount of points as Harvick. We'll take that. That is a net gain. Uh, Jeff Burton, again, another top 10, quietly becoming the most consistent driver in the Ford camp. I think so. Uh, top 12 for um, Scott Smith. Great run right there. And you look through the field here. Everham, the only Everham Dodge. If you're just tuning into this playthrough, the nine car is gone. So uh, that's the only Everham car left in the field. Uh, kind of a sad story. Uh, they go to the back of the pack. It's going to be the 30 car, Steve Park, and Kurt Busch, the bottom of the barrel. Thank you all so much for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hope to see you in the next episode of Thunder 04. And for all your diecast shopping needs, make sure you use that promo code DIECASTBUFFET at checkout. For any orders, $30 or more, you can save on shipping, guys. And, um, well, we're on to Michigan, Invideon, and then well, the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you all. Have a great one. God bless. Diecast Buffet. Signing off.